Good morning. Welcome to week number eight of online services. Um, Charlie and Scott and Carl have certainly done a wonderful job sharing messages. I know that when I'm at home, I find it a little bit easy to be distracted by things around the house rather than paying attention. So I just want to encourage all of us to, to think about that and try to pay attention to the living, active Word of God and uh, focus on that. As I was preparing the message, I thought of uh, what I read eight weeks ago, the last time we met at the chapel. And I think it's appropriate to read it, parts of it again. It was the uh, C.S. Lewis's comments regarding the atomic age at that time, but as we talked about eight weeks ago, it could easily be applied to today's world. And I'm just gonna read parts of it. C.S. Lewis said, in other words, do not let us begin by exaggerating the novelty of our situation. Believe me, dear sir or madam, you and all who live and all who we love are already sentenced to death before the atomic bomb or before COVID-19. And quite a high percentage of us were going to die in unpleasant ways. We have indeed one very great advantage over our ancestors, anesthetics, but we have that still. It's perfectly ridiculous to go about whimpering and drawing long faces because scientists have had one more way of painful and premature deaths to a world that's already bristling with such chances. So the point is this, and as we talk about Philippians chapter two uh, today, this kind of ties together with Philippians chapter two and the world that we live in today. This is the point then, and our first action to be taken is to pull ourselves together. If we're going to be destroyed by an atomic bomb or whatever, let that bomb comes when it does, find us doing sensible and human things, praying, working, teaching, reading, listening to music, <clears throat> bathing the children, playing tennis, chatting with our friends, having a game of darts, <clears throat> not huddled together like some frightened sheep, thinking about bombs or microbes. They may break our bodies, a microbe can do that, but they need not dominate our minds. And as you might recall, a theme of Philippians is that of our thoughts, thinking what is true, honorable, right, lovely, pure, of good repute, of excellence, things that are worthy of praise. So if we could open in prayer, just uh, thank you, Father, for your word <clears throat> and help us to set aside those distractions, to set aside our thoughts that would wander, to focus on you, to focus on who you are and the fact that you are in control in a time that we, we sense that we have very little control of things. We acknowledge your control and May your spirit just guide us and teach us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I, some years ago, I sat across the table from a behavioral consultant who was working with us at Great River Homes. And this behavioral consultant was a very skilled person and one who I think probably has saved the lives of quite a few people with mental illnesses who are suicidal. So a very, very skilled, very knowledgeable person. and. Uh, as we reviewed plans for Great River Homes to provide services to this person who uh, was going to be moving into Great River Homes, at one point during her presentation, the, uh, the consultant just looked at me and said, you need to get this point right. And she repeated it again, you really need to get this point right. If you do not, there will be chaos and you will open up Pandora's box to all kinds of issues, to all kinds of conflict. You need to get this point right. So if we were going to have a title for the message, it would be, you need to get this point right. Um, <clears throat> and the uh, point is for Philippians chapter two, the point of humility, the point of walking in harmony, the point of putting others before ourselves. We need to get that point right. Or if we do not, we open up Pandora's box. We open up um, all kinds of conflict, all kinds of trouble, all kinds of difficulty within the church, within the family, within ourselves. We need to get this point right. So perhaps tonight when you're falling asleep, think about that point. We need to get this point, Philippians chapter two, humility, harmony, putting others before ourselves. We need to get that point right. Christ-centered humility. Philippians chapter two, verse five, tells us to uh, have this attitude in yourselves, which is also in Christ Jesus. So true humility 
is centered around Christ. It is Christ. It's, a, <clears throat> it's not ourselves. It's dependent on real, our relationship with Christ. True humility flows from Christ. True humility is the, the vaccine, if you will, for the destructive, selfish conflict that uh, the world tends to experience. <clears throat> true humility is not self-improvement. True humility is not the opposite. It's not self-abasement. True humility is, is Christ. It has its roots in Christ. Not in <clears throat> rules, not in social pressure, not in self-righteousness, but in Christ. So as we journey through Philippians, today we'll look at uh, a man named Aphrodite. What do you know about him? If I just ask you off the top of your head, what do you know about him? Most of us will probably know very little. But mentioned in verses 25 through 30 is of Philippians chapter 2 is Aphrodite, an ordinary man who did extraordinary things for God. He models for us what we might think of as being extraordinary in the ordinary. So if you're not there already, if you could turn to chapter 2 of Ephra and look at uh, verses 25 through 30 of Philippians chapter 2. But I thought it necessary to send to you Aphrodite, my brother, fellow worker, fellow soldier, who is also your messenger and minister to my needs. Because he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. For indeed, he was sick to the point of death. But God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but also on me, so I would not have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I sent him all the more eagerly, so that when you see him again, you may rejoice, and I may be less concerned about you. Receive him, then, in the Lord with all joy, and hold men like him in high regard, because he came close to the point of death for the work of Christ, risking his life, to complete what was deficient in your service to me. It's, <clears throat> so he was sent to be extraordinary in the ordinary. And one more verse um, that speaks of Aphrodite, verse, chapter 4, verse 18. And as I read that verse, it gives some clue as to what, that, what he was like. Um, but I've received everything in full and abundance. I'm amply su supplied, having received from Aphrodite what you have sent. And he goes on, that <clears throat> the context is he sent money, sent offerings to Paul. So he, Aphrodite was a, a messenger, obviously trusted, loyal, and uh, trustworthy. And he, Aphrodite was a man who was an example of the theme of Philippians chapter 2, that of being walking in harmony, walking in humility. And that is the point that we have to get right. Chuck Swindoll tells a story about a uh, six-year-old girl who had developed a very serious, deathly illness that was terminal. But there was one way that, he, that she could survive. <clears throat> she needed a blood transfusion from somebody who had her rare blood type and who also had had the disease and survived the disease. Doctors checked many different places, could not find anyone who could uh, meet that need. Eventually, they came across the fact that the girl's nine-year-old brother would be a suitable person to be able to provide that blood transfusion. Everybody was a little bit hesitant to ask a nine-year-old to uh, provide the transfusion, the blood for it. And they eventually elected the doctor to ask the, the nine-year-old if, if he would do that. And the nine-year-old, when he heard the situation, um, without hesitation said, sure, I'll give blood for my sister. And <clears throat> the day came when they uh, started the procedure. They pricked the boy's arm or finger, whatever it is. And the boy looked across the room, across the next cot and smiled at his sister. And he closed his eyes and waited silently for the process to, to go on. And when the process was over, the uh, doctor came in and thanked the boy for being willing to do what he had done. And at that point, uh, <clears throat> the boy, with tears coming down his cheeks, looked at the doctor and uh, very calmly asked, Doctor, when do I die? 
It was only at that point where the doctor realized that the boy thought that uh, he, he was going to die as he was giving blood for his sister, did not realize it was just a partial transfusion. <clears throat> and uh, the doctor said, why did you risk your life for your sister? And the uh, boy's response, simple but profound, boy's response is beautiful. The boy said, because I love my sister. And as I thought about that story, I thought, what a profound picture of the gospel. The boy was willing to give up his life for his sister, to give up his life that she might have life, not because of peer pressure, not because of rules, not because of following the Ten Commandments, not because of trying to be self-righteous, but simply profoundly because he loved his sister. <clears throat> and likewise, it says in Philippians 2.30, Aphroditus risked his life for the work of Christ. He risked his life because he loved Paul. He risked his life because he loved the Philippians. He risked his life because he loved the Lord. And as noted in Philippians 4.18, Aphrodite brought money to Paul, making him guilty by association because he was going to see a prisoner who was under judgment. By associating with him, Aphrodite was risking his own life. And he did the extraordinary in the ordinary, very ordinary man who did extraordinary things. And we can take hope in that, knowing that uh, we're, we're ordinary people. The Lord, obviously, being God, did great things, was humble. Paul, being a great man, also was humble. Timothy, as we looked about earlier in chapter 2, was humble. But uh, Aphrodite, very ordinary man, did great things, extraordinary things for the Lord. <clears throat> so as we go on, just a quick review of a couple verses of a book that we covered some time back. Uh, Obadiah chapter, well, there's only one chapter, verse 3, verse 4. The arrogance of your heart has deceived you, you who live in the clefts of the rocks, in the loftiness of your dwelling place, who say in your heart, who will bring me down to earth? Though you build high like the eagle, though you set your nest among the stars, from there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. So Aphrodite, or Obadiah, a book about pride, the arrogance, the deceitfulness of the human heart. I bring that up because I like to review books because we tend to forget everything, but also because um, it's a good contrast to the message of Philippians chapter 2, walking in humility, putting others before ourselves, the point that we have to get right. Philippians chapter 2, God calls us to walk in humility, considering ourselves, others is more important than ourselves. <laughs> So as you recall, the uh, overriding theme of Philippians chapter 2, humility, unity, harmony, things that are supernatural, things that don't occur naturally. <clears throat> so in the days of a pandemic caused by a virus, in the days of a pandemic caused by sin, the arrogance of the human heart, the deceitfulness of a human heart, there's a desperate need, there's a <clears throat> compelling need for for you and me to walk in humility, unity, harmony, <clears throat> and perhaps especially with those who we are quarantined with, it's sometimes easier to be nice to people out and about, right? But to walk in humility with those who we live in close association with, and also to walk in humility with those within the church, within the body of Christ, within the spiritual family, so Philippians chapter 2 starts out with emphasizing humility at the very beginning. If you have that open, just kind of skim the book with me, or the chapter with me. And then we're given examples of humility, verses 5 through 11, really center on the person of Christ, and that, again, is foundational to this whole concept of humility. <clears throat> we see the example of Christ walking in humility, the source, the center, the enabler of humility. And then starting with verse 17, we see three examples of humility. And we've talked about the first two already. 
verses 17 and 18, the, um, the example of the sacrificial life of Paul. Verses 19 through 24, Timothy, seeking after Christ, walking in humility. And then we come, verses 25 through 30, we come to the, the common person, the everyday person, Ephroditus, who was extraordinary in the ordinary. He walked in humility, he fostered humility, and he's a great message, a great encouragement, a great example for those of us who are common. Um, <clears throat> Jesus, Timothy, Ephroditus, ordinary men who modeled biblical harmony. Before we uh, take a closer look at Ephroditus, I would like to welcome a guest speaker who would like to uh, expound upon the topic of harmony, humility, walking in unity. I think you'll find that he has a unique creative way of sharing what that harmony is, what humility can look like. The guest speaker is Jack, our Siber Siberian Husky. During a recent uh, Good Friday hymn service, Jack unexpectedly revealed a God-given talent of uh, promoting harmony, promoting a sense of unity in music as he sang along with Linda, as Linda sang along with the, the, the Good Friday hymns that we had. Now, you're going to have to use your imagination a little bit because I'm not going to ask Linda to sing along with this, but um, as you hear Jack in a minute, just imagine that you're hearing Linda as well. And <clears throat> she'll be missing from what you're about to hear, but uh, just imagine you're hearing her. And as Linda sang high, the high notes of the hymns, Jack would uh, sing high, harmonized. And as Linda sang lower notes, Jack promptly, properly lowered his singing to hit the same lower notes. <clears throat> and Jack sang along with several hymns. So you'll not, you're not be able to hear Linda anymore fully appreciate it. It was hilarious to be there. I actually laughed out loud, which is something that happens about once every three years. It was hilarious. <clears throat> but just imagine that you hear Linda singing along as you hear Jack sharing his harmony with us with a little encouragement from his uh, uh, quarantined housemates. All right. So just a little encouragement from Jack to, to walk in harmony with each other. Jack wants us to remember that point. Jack would remind us to walk in harmony when we grumble, when we complain, when we lose our patience. Kind of like Jack being off note once in a while. Um, Jack would remind us to walk in harmony. <clears throat> Most of the time as we sang those Good Friday hymns, Jack was pretty much right on. He, he harmonized with Linda. And... Uh, <clears throat> Jack kind of illustrates the point that we need to walk in harmony with those within the church. There were other times where Jack was clearly sounding a sour note, and that's kind of what our grumbling and complaining would sound before the Lord, right? <clears throat> when we forget Christ, when we pursue our own agenda, we are kind of like those sour notes that um, Jack would once in a while hit. I know that I've repeated the theme of um, walking in harmony, walking in humility, about 50 times in about 20 different ways in the last three or four or five messages. But there's a reason for that. We have to get this point right. The behavioral consultant who worked with me when this person moved into Great River Homes met with me three or four times a week. And she would always make the point. You have to get this point right. And that stuck with me because she repeated that point again and again and again. So I'm doing the same. We have to get this point right. The point of Philippians chapter 2. Walking in harmony, walking in humility. And I, I don't apologize for repeating it. We, we need to get this point right. And I don't know about you, but I need to hear it frequently. <clears throat> we have to get this point right. Walking in biblical, Christ-centered humility. Because if we do not get that point right, we open up Pandora's box, we open up a oh, uh, door, <clears throat> an, an opening for Satan. 
we opening up, open up the uh, tearing the church apart, tearing our families apart, tearing marriages apart, and even tearing ourselves apart. We have to get this point right. <clears throat> As Paul warned the Galatians, take care lest you consume and devour one another. We have to get this point right. So if we could turn to Philippians chapter 2, verse 25, we'll start to look a little more specifically at Ephroditus, chapter 2, verse 25. But I thought necessary to send to you Ephroditus, my brother and fellow worker, fellow soldier, who is also your messenger and minister to my needs. Note that uh, Aphrodite has been a minister to Paul. Paul's in prison. It's desolate. It's lonely. His, certain, his future is very uncertain, which may sound familiar to us. And he's going to, Paul's going through a very difficult time. Yet Paul's focus is on others. His... Um, his close companion, Ephroditus, he wants to send back to the Philippians to comfort the Philippians. So Paul's focus, even in a very great trial, very great difficulty, is ministering to others, walking in humility, walking in harmony, walking to encourage others. Paul got the point right. And in verse 25, notice... A little word, my. Sometimes in scripture, it's the little words that really stand out. My. My brother. Sense the, the intimacy between Paul and Epiditus. Paul doesn't say, a brother. Paul says, my brother. <clears throat> and if you were to flip the page back to Philippians 1, 8, <clears throat> chapter 1, verse 8. Paul says, I long for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. <clears throat> the intimacy, the closeness that we've often talked about between Paul and the Philippians, that should be present in any church, walking in harmony, walking in unity, putting the needs of others before ourselves, getting that point right. <clears throat> As I thought of my brother, it reminds me of, that nine-year-old boy saying, because I love my sister, my sister. So going back to the idea of truth-seeking questions, to what degree do we long for developing our relationships with others in the church? And maybe the quarantine has sharpened our focus on that question um, when we can't meet what degree do we really desire to cultivate relationships? To what degree do we really want to cultivate, to grow the attitude of Christ, to, be, to humble ourselves, to consider other saints as precious, to consider other believers as my brother or my sister? A sense of unity, going back to Philippians chapter 1, verse 8, longing for fellow saints with all the affection of Christ. We have to get that point right. <clears throat> I've used this saying quite often. It's very <clears throat> convicting to me, and I'll bring it back up again as we think about a practical application of this. Um, our love for our spouse is not determined by who our spouse is, but by who our God is. And we can apply that to any relationship, <clears throat> our love for our children, our love for our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. It's not determined by who they are because they are not perfect, but by who our God is, <clears throat> Christ-centered humility. We have to get this point right. And what is this point? And you fill in the blank yourself for a second. What is this point? We have to get this point right. Philippians chapter 2, right? Humility, harmony, putting the needs of others before ourselves. <clears throat> God calls us to be extraordinary in the ordinary. And we do that by getting that point right, by walking in humility. 
in a sense, giving our blood for that six-year-old sister to walk in harmony. That would make Jack proud <clears throat> to walk in unity. Verse 26, chapter 2. Because he was longing <clears throat> for you all and was distressed because you heard he was sick. Notice the intensity, the passion of Ephroditus in that verse. <clears throat> he was sick, sick to the point of death. Verse 30 says that um, he was close to death, risking his life for the work of the Lord. In the midst of all of that, kind of like Paul, difficult circumstances, Ephroditus could have been having a pity party, like I might choose to have in that kind of a situation. <clears throat> but... His focus is on the needs of the Philippians. He's concerned about the Philippians. And like Paul, he exemplifies putting the needs of others before ourselves. That's not natural. It has to be Christ-centered. <clears throat> Chapter 2, verse 30, he risked his life to serve the Philippians. He risked his life to serve Paul. He risked his life to serve the Lord. There's some uncertainty just what that phrase means he risked his life some suggest that he knowingly went to a place that was disease ridden and risked his life that way through medical angles based on the wording of Philippians chapter 2 verse 30 John MacArthur suggests that um, the context would seem to be he risked his life as a martyr came close to dying as a martyr <clears throat> Whatever the case, he risked his life to, to serve the Lord, to serve Paul, to serve the Philippians. He exemplified humility, putting the needs of others first. He risked his life for the sake of Christ. In reference to Christ-centered humility, Ephroditus got the point right. We need to get that point right. Verse 29 of Philippians chapter 2 tells us how the Philippians were to receive Ephroditus when, when he returned. Um, he was not a quitter. Ephroditus was not a quitter. Paul was sending him back. The Philippians had sent Ephroditus <clears throat> to Paul. Now Paul is sending him back, and he wants to make sure that the Philippians know that it's Paul sending them back, that Ephroditus is not a quitter. Verse 29, Paul tells the Philippians, Receive him then in the Lord with all joy, and hold men like him in high regard. He lays it out for us that um, how we should respond to others within the church with all joy. We respond to others within the church with, with joy, with Jack-approved harmony. If we respond to one another, and with joy, or as it says later in that verse, with high regard, with respect, like the uh, nine-year-old brother willing to lay down his life for a sister, we will promote harmony, we will promote unity, we will promote a sense of oneness that's so vital within the church, within the family, within marriages, whatever it might be, we have to get that point right. <clears throat> As we start to wrap up our consideration of Philippians and 4, 418 and Ephroditus, um, looking at who he was, he was sent by the Philippians to bring a financial gift to Paul and to encourage Paul, to be a messenger for Paul, to be an encourager to Paul. And if you use your imagination a little bit, picture the scene in the Philippian church they are having a church meeting and Margaret brought her cookies and um, they are sitting around the table and who should we send to Paul? <clears throat> and they are kind of contemplating the options, knowing that whoever they send is going to go into a dangerous situation, maybe health wise, maybe persecution wise, it's a dangerous situation. They're also going to face the subtle danger of the temptation of, money and maybe using some of the money that's being sent to Paul for their own use, <clears throat> being tempted financially. So, so there's some challenges out there. 
Um, and uh, Aphrodite is, is the man that they eventually choose. So <clears throat> in addition to the point of humility and harmony being right, Aphrodite was obviously a person who the Philippians knew to be courageous. They knew him to be honest. He was extraordinary in the ordinary. So again, not a famous person like Paul, not a famous person like Timothy, not a person that is all that well known, <clears throat> even for, with those of us who study the Bible, a common person like you, like me, who did extraordinary things for the Lord. That journey to see Paul might have been long, might have been difficult. He might have been wondering, does it make any difference? I'm doing this. <clears throat> But in the end, he was extraordinary in the ordinary. He was faithful to the Lord. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> in closing, I told this story about 14 years ago, but I reserve the right to repeat stories every 14 years, knowing that you won't remember them. Um, hiking in Whitewater recently, I uh, was reminded of uh, something that happened with my son Josiah and I. We were hiking at Whitewater State Park, hiking along one of the streams down there. <coughs> And one of the Department of Natural Resources employees who was working there was assessing how many trout were in the stream. And uh, one of the employees asked Josiah and I to uh, guess how many trout we thought were in the water near to where, where we were standing. The water was only two or three feet deep. It was clear. And uh, <clears throat> we looked closely for a while, Josiah and I did. We couldn't see any trout. But we figured there's probably got to be someone there. He wouldn't be asking us that. So we guessed what we thought would be a high number. We suggested that maybe there was five trout there. And uh, at that point, the DNR employee applied some low voltage electrical current to the water. And uh, about 50 trout came floating to the surface. <clears throat> 50 trout that we could not see. But they were there. They were camouflaged camouflaged, hiding underneath the rocks or camouflaged to the bottom of the, the, the stream bed. And so it is with humility and putting others first. <clears throat> we might start out a day thinking, I'm going to get this point right. We're going <clears> to, <throat> I'm going to walk in humility today. We see no obvious evil spiritual trout, if you will, to hinder us from that, from doing that. But then the day starts and uh, the low voltage, maybe high voltage in this case, electrical current supplied by the enemies of our souls, that being the world and Satan and our flesh start to show up and the spiritual trout start floating to the surface. Selfishness, pride, being in a hurry, bad habits, whatever the case might be. And instead of walking in humility, all of a sudden we begin to grumble, we begin to complain, we begin to be impatient using those tones of voice that irritate others, being in a hurry, ignoring others. You know, you know the rope, all those 50 different trout, if you will, spiritual trout that were camouflaged. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> we run into problems. And I think of the uh, hymn that I've come to love, His mercy is more. My sins, they are many, but his, <clears throat> his mercy is more. If you're not familiar with that hymn, and even if you are, I would encourage you to look up the words of that and contemplate it. Because sometimes it can, can be discouraging when we do the same thing that we did yesterday and the day before. And we're not showing humility. We're not showing compassion. We're not walking in harmony. My sins, they are many. His mercy is more. There, there's hope. There's encouragement. The slate is wiped clean, and the Lord is compassionate, as we looked at in the Gospel of Mark. <clears throat> in the past two or three weeks, two of my coworkers showed signs of uh, the coronavirus, COVID-19, and <clears throat> it was recommended they were tested, and they, they were both tested. And there's that waiting period of two to three days where you know that they have the signs, <clears throat> the symptoms of the, the virus, but you're not sure if they have it or not. And <clears throat> you start to think of all the implications that would be 
in place if they did have it, as far as the people who live in the house where I work who are very vulnerable to any respiratory issues. And there's a lot of uncertainty, there's a lot of tension, and uh, <clears throat> in both cases, fortunately, the test came back negative. So that was good news. But as I think of uh, sin, we can take comfort in the fact that the uh, if we're believers in the Lord, the test comes back negative because there is no condemnation in Christ. So we have forgiveness, we have Christ, we have the opportunity to know that our sins, though they are many, his mercy is more. And because of that, we can be encouraged, even though we blow it and we sin, we can have that uh, encouragement to uh, start each day knowing that though our sins are many, his mercy is more, and to do what it says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, to um, have this attitude in yourselves, which is also in Christ Jesus, that of being humility. And <clears throat> in closing, just contemplate the fact that um, we need to get this point right, Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, or, or the whole theme of Philippians chapter 2. And though we will fall, we can get up and, and go back to the situation, go back to the challenge, knowing that Though our sins there are many, his mercy is more. And with that, I'll close in prayer. We just thank you, Father, for that promise that though our sins are many, your mercy is more. And we contemplate you know, chapter 2, verse 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, where we see your humility, your grace, your tenderness beyond what we can understand. And help us to be encouraged by that to look to you for, for grace, for your spirit to walk in humility. Because we have to get this point right, knowing that if we walk without complaining, we'll be a light in a fear-filled world and help us to, to show that kind of love that that nine-year-old brother had for his six-year-old sister. In Jesus' name I pray and give thanks. Amen.